Welcome to today's devotion. We are in Luke chapter 9. Last time we were together, we took a look at um, verses 46 through 50. Today we are going to take a look at verses 51 through 56. So let's pray and get into it. Thank you, Father, for your word and your spirit that so faithfully reveals the truth that you Know that we're ready to hear and to absorb and to understand. And so now, Father, as we go into your word again, please open our hearts and minds to hear your voice as you speak to us through your word. Change us and transform how we think that all of our thoughts and actions give glory to you. This we thank you for in Jesus' name. Amen. Verse 51 When the days were coming to a close for him to be taken up, he determined to journey to Jerusalem. He sent messengers ahead of himself, and on the way they entered a village of the Samaritans to make preparations for him. But they did not welcome him because he was determined to journey to Jerusalem. When the disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven to consume them? But he turned and rebuked them, and they went to another village. Then we get into verse 57. As they were traveling on the road, someone said to him, I'll, and there's this interaction. But that little, those few verses, 51 through 56, very important. Um, some merit... <laughs> Samaria was just north of Judea. Now you have Judea that that encompasses Jerusalem itself. And then north of Judea, you have Samaria. And that's where the Samaritans live. And then north of Samaria, you have Galilee, where Jesus ministered and um, spent a lot of time there. Spent more time probably in Galilee than any other place. That being said, when Jesus would come down from Galilee to Jerusalem and to go back north, he would have to go through Samaria. So there are a lot of occasions that are recorded in Scripture where there's interactions with Samaritans. Probably the most well-known is the Samaritan woman. He is going, um, this is the Gospel of John, he's going um, north to Galilee uh, after he learns that the Pharisees have heard that he is gaining momentum and, and baptizing more disciples than John, although it actually wasn't Jesus, it was Jesus' disciples who were doing it regardless Words started getting around, and he and 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 he was becoming well known. And when he learns of this, he leaves Judea and goes back to Galilee. As such, he goes through Samaria, and he gets to a well, takes a, a break there. The disciple, his disciples, go into the town to buy food, and he has uh, a conversation with a Samaritan woman who has come to draw water. And that's in the Gospel of John. And it's very important, this little interaction. And she even points it out to him. You're a Jew. Why are you talking to me? They have very, very little in common. For example, the Samaritans believe that the place for them to worship is where Moses uh, gave the blessings and the curses, but the blessings when Israel went into, or right before Israel went into the promised land. Mount Ebal, I believe, is the name of it. That's where the Samaritans worshiped. However, the Jews believed that in order to worship God properly, you had to do it in Jerusalem. And so there was a bone, a big bone of contention. The Samaritans only held to the first five books of the Bible. They did not, or what we would call the Old Testament, they did not acknowledge any of the history, Joshua, Judges, 
um, any of Samuel or Kings, etc. They didn't acknowledge any of that. And there grown, there had grown a um, an, an adversarial attitude between the two, because in each mind, one was pure and one was not. And it's this animosity that Jesus came in a very direct way to break down. One of the fulfillments of Jesus' ministry, his death, his resurrection, and the giving of his spirit was the fulfillment that was originally given to Abraham, which is from you, all nations will be blessed. You see, <laughs> when God created the world, his intention was for he and his family, human family, to spread out over the world and to create the Garden of Eden over the entire planet. It was a place where, with the garden, hu humans lived Adam and Eve in this case, but also God dwelt there. He walked among them. It was God's domain. It was God's abode. When the rebellion came in, there was a, a schism between this world and the spiritual world, and God no longer had a place for him to dwell. And as such, no need to get into the, the deeper history. It's, it's important to know, though, there was a complete an utter rebellion that spread through humanity so that the flood had to come. And after the flood, God started over through Noah and his family. And they spread out into the different nations. And you have a table of nations. It's even called that in the scripture. That's where you begin to get the nation state, if you will. The nation, it was, it was defined by boundaries and peoples. But after the Tower of Babel and that rebellion, God gave those nations over to the various deities that they wanted to worship rather than himself. He disinherited them and started all over again with Abraham. And through Abraham, his intention was that all these nations that had rebelled against him, that he confused their language so that they could not work together would come back to him, reject their gods, and come back. And so that promise that all nations would come back to their original creator, their one God, the true God, was always the intention of God. And that intention and promise and hope was now being fulfilled through Jesus. This is why wherever Jesus went, he was not antagonistic to those nations, but rather inviting them to follow him as he brought them back into the worship of the true one God. The greatest resistance against this, however, was in Jerusalem. The very people that claimed to be God's representatives on earth, especially as it pertained to his selection of Israel and the location that God gave Israel to live, the promised land. So, going through Samaria was a, uh, a journey and a situation that would always bring to the forefront this deep-seated conflict and resentment. And whenever Jesus went through Samaria, whether it was the Samaritan woman or in this case going towards Jerusalem, he always diffused it. Because his, while the enemy will work to stir up resentment, while the enemy will work to stir up division, God will always work to bring together. Today, I had uh, an opportunity to share, as I was talking with, um, well, my friend Lauren, he's in Michigan. And I was sharing with him, there was a friend of mine that um, I went to high school with. And I don't, I'm not on Facebook. I, I don't really 
find it beneficial. But I do, I, I still have an account and on occasion I'll get notifications as to somebody posting. And my friend from high school who I haven't talked to since 1984 posted something that was, well, kind of offensive to me anyway. And I had a reaction in my mind that I was going to post something or respond to it. And I said, no, that's just stirring the pot, which is what the original post was intended to do, stir the pot. And as I was sharing this with Lauren, he said to me, reminded me that we human beings were not adversaries. We weren't created to be adversaries. We were created to be a family on many different continents, but one family, one God. And that the fight, if you will, if we are going to be adversaries is not between ourselves, but against those principalities and powers that have set themselves up against God. And rather than taking the posture of engaging in fighting another person, the calling of every believer is to fight in the heavenly realm for that person to engage in spiritual battle on behalf of that person, to engage in tearing down anything that sets themselves up against God for that person. And that is a completely different paradigm than what's being pushed in our culture and in the world. And as it turns out, my friend, who I actually haven't spoken to, in years is very upfront and public about being an atheist and is also very upfront that he does not want the church involved in any of our cultural institutions. That being said, the framing that he is not my enemy that he is created to be my brother in God brings me to the point that it is my responsibility not to react in animosity like what we just read um, happened with Jesus when he went through um, James and John. Should we react with anger, cast out? No. Rather, we should go into battle on their behalf in the spiritual realm. A lot easier said than done, however. Well, thank you so much for tuning in today. Next time, we will start with verse 57 of chapter 9. Until then, may the peace of God be with you, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.